Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. We ask that you will be with us in this Sabbath school. Send your Holy Spirit to give us understanding. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, I, I'm still getting echo behind me. I can hear my voice a few microseconds after it's I speak. It's better. It's better now? Okay. That's good. Thank you. All right, so open up your Bibles to Ezra, 
or you can look in your quarterly to our memory text. <clears throat> I know that all of you, being the early birds that you are, study the lesson and, uh, and you know everything there is to know about this lesson this week, right? Amen. Amen. All right? Good. Because I have at least three days worth of information <laughs> to dump on you in less than one hour. Okay. Well, I love that. <laughs> we love hearing you. Amen. All right. <clears throat> so the title of our lesson this week is Worshiping the Lord. We should have lots to say about that, right? Yeah. 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 All right, here in Ezra, um, chapter 3, verse 11. It's our memory text for today. <clears throat> and it says, And they sang responsibly, 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 sorry, it's early. <laughs> and they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Now, this, uh, I have to walk, sorry. <laughs> this, this memory text is when? Does anybody know when this one was written? We're studying Nehemiah. Was it after the temple was built? It was after the temple was built. Not the wall. This was 70, 60, 70 years before the wall was finished. Okay? So, I, when I read that, I thought, you know, why did they, I, I understand the, the title of, the, of this week's lesson, but why did they put uh, something in here that we're not studying? Because we're studying about Nehemiah and the building of the wall, right? And Ezra was a part of that, but Ezra came a long time before. And it's talking about their responsiveness to the building of the temple and the finishing of the temple 60 years before. But our study this week is on Nehemiah, the finishing of the wall, and the celebration, if you will, of that. Okay? And so I was kind of confused about that. But then really, if you think about it, Ezra and Nehemiah, being contemporaries, um, had a lot in common. Very two different leaders, and yet a lot of the same stuff happened uh, with each of them, okay? Uh, in the coming out of Babylon to setting out in Jerusalem and getting things done in their time frames. Okay, a lot of, of parallels there. But this week, we also have a lot of parallels did you know that Ezra and Nehemiah are end time books? Mm -hmm. You knew that already? How'd you know that? <laughs> they are end time books. There are a lot of similarities between Ezra and Nehemiah and modern Israel today. Not literal Israel. Modern Israel. You and I, Israel. Okay? <clears throat> There's a lot of common similarities. We don't have time to go through all of them, so we're just going to talk about the one on worship. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. chapter 14 and verse 7. Revelation 14 and verse 7. And it says there, saying with a loud voice, 
Fear God. What does fear mean? Respect. 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 Honor. 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 Those sort of things, yes. Okay. Respect and fear God and give glory to Him. What does give glory to Him mean? Worship. Just like what we're talking about today. Worship. Okay. And it goes on, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Okay? Now I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to tell you right now the popular answer is wrong. Okay? Just so you know that ahead of time. So the question is, why does God deserve our worship? And yes, the popular answer is wrong. <laughs> so, think of something other than the popular one. Feel free. Raise your hand. We've got mics roving. Be happy to hear what you have to say. Don't make me be here all day because I've got a ton of stuff. Because when we worship God, we reflect Him in us. It's a combination. All right, very good. I like that. Good. Anything else? Why does God deserve our worship? It's not really a hard one, is it? Because of his sacrifice? That's a popular answer. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> because of God. <laughs> yeah, because of who he is. Okay. What do you mean by that? What do you he, mean by who he is? He is the great I am. He, he, he is everything. The leaders in China and Korea think they're the great I am. They think they are, but they're not. <laughs> He's the creator. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm, that's the popular answer, by the way. Which, you said that salvation. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> there, let me tell you why. Okay. Tell why. So you have two people, and they have a kid procreated, right? And they want this kid to serve them. Do the parents who are abusive deserve the worship of that child? No. No. That's right. So. God is not worthy to be worshipped just because he's creator. Okay? Now you can include that once we establish a few other things, but that does not make him worthy. But God but, is not abusive. He is not. Okay? That's good. He is love. So it's important for us to establish why God deserves to be worshipped. Because it's a part of the everlasting gospel, and we need to understand why. Otherwise, we cannot relay it to other people. Right? Because I can go to work every day, and people will know that I'm religious, and that I serve God, but they have no obligation or interest in what it is I'm doing. They have their own agenda, okay? And, uh, and so uh, for me to be able to relay to somebody else what I feel about in my religion, I'm going to have to explain in a way that is desirable for someone else to want to worship God like I do, right? Okay, so, there. Yeah. Why? Does God deserve to be worshipped? I left my notes on the at home. <laughs> Several Sabbaths ago, I talked about in ancient Egypt, they worshipped a frog. Mm -hmm. And I made the statement, how many of us tonight will sit down or pray to a God who is a frog? Or today, the Hindus pray to the rat. And they pour milk and honey and they pour it over their heads and blah, blah, blah. God, our God that we have, he wants us to continually get better, to reach him. He gives us knowledge and abundance. He forgives us all our sins. No other God out of the world has ever done that and will ever be. Very good. You nailed it on the head. Okay. So um, you have to find a way for that to be a part of you in your relationships with your friends and co-workers. 
and then they desire that same thing. Amen. Okay? And so uh, the Bible, of course, tells us why God is, uh, why we want to worship God. And you'll find that in Revelation 5. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. Revelation 5 and verse 9. And it says there, and they sing a new song. What is uh, singing? Worship. It's worship. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's worship. That's what we're talking about today. It says, they sing a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Okay? So here we see a reason why God deserves our worship. Do you understand that verse? Do you know what it says? Because God came down out of heaven, became a man, sacrificed his life to save us. That is why he deserves worship. Okay? Now, it goes more than that. It goes into character. The character of God. Okay? The type of personality that God is. That also is a part of it. And so we see this with Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah both had reason to worship God. Can you give me those reasons? Why did Ezra and Nehemiah have good reason to worship God? The same reason we do, because of the things in his life, the things in their lives that uh, that their relationship. Okay. All right. Can you be more specific? Because see, we look back to the death of Christ. They had to look forward to it, um, and uh, and so what is it at the uh, temple when it was finished and at the wall when it was finished that they had to rejoice about. It was fulfilled. The prophecies were fulfilled. Okay. Say that the, again. So I the again. prophecies were fulfilled. Okay, what prophecies were fulfilled? The wall them returning, the timing, mm -hmm. the fact the walls were brailed and they had protection and the temple was built, all these other nations wanted to kill them and destroy them, but God opened the door. For oh, very good. Yeah. So they could recount what God had done for them in the past, right? He came to the end of the 70 year captivity and, uh, and he delivered them out of Babylon. They were able to go back home uh, in the rebuilding of the temple and rebuilding of the wall very quickly and getting that all done, they had a lot to be thankful for, right? Amen. Yeah, from their point of view. Anybody else's point of view, like Babylon's point of view, they're just like, they're people, but, you know. But. I just think of the, of the comment or the statement, um, we have nothing to fear for the future except for forget what God has done in the past, mm -hmm. and that's what they were doing, they were remembering yes. history. That's we right. have to be able to relate what God has done for us, mm -hmm. and we can't. Yeah. We don't feel worship. We don't understand the need for worship. And we're so selfish and egotistical unless we have that history. And some of us can gain that history through reading and studying. And some of us just have to be batted around long enough that we, you know, we'll figure out that we gotta do something different. But it's the history is the issue. That's right. So no about uh, no amount of power makes anyone worth worshiping, but God has gone the extra mile and has brought himself down to our level, sacrificed his life for our salvation. And now we being on this side of the cross rather than on the other side of the cross, we have even more to be thankful for than even they did in celebrating what they were celebrating in their salvation from Babylon. Okay? Now, let's talk about another similarity 
Another similarity of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah in us today. Go ahead, Nate. Uh, sometimes I think we put God um, as only caring and loving for us uh, to, to a certain group of people. And much of the scriptures have to do with the Israelites, but you know, God is much bigger than that. He so loved the world, not the dirt and all that kind of stuff, but the humans that occupy it. And so in all of these other nations, he certainly cared for them and was trying to woo them to him, you know, to the Holy Spirit. And and so you know, even today, you know, many Christians, you know, different denominations think we're the exclusive ones and so forth. And and really, you know, God is trying to win everybody over no matter what religion or no religion and all of that. So religion is just a title. Could be. <laughs> just check it. So um, God has had his people go ahead. Uh, in support of, of David, there, what he said, there was an instance where uh, in the Bible it talks about their cup of iniquity was not full. And so the Israelites were actually stalled out a bit so that God could give Amorites, I believe it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, give them a little more time. So what they said is absolutely right. It is the world. It is all the Amorites and all the ites <laughs> that God is concerned but. He, the Israelites could have moved forward a little sooner, I think, but because the cup of indignation wasn't full, God gave them a little bit more time and stalled them out of it. And don't think that the Israelites coming to Jordan was not a wake-up call for Canaan. They knew very well what the Israelites were going to do, and they had an opportunity to change. So, um, never without excuse, for sure. So... <clears throat> We can also remember Jonah. You know, Jonah did not go to Israel. Jonah went somewhere else. And he didn't want to because they weren't Israelites. So, um, so when he went uh, and they repented, guess what? They didn't die then. <laughs> it took a little while longer, but uh, they repented. All right, so let's look at another similarity between Ezra and Nehemiah and us. How about um, coming out of Babylon? That's a similarity, is it not? Okay, uh, where do we see this in the Bible? Go back to Revelation chapter 14, and, uh, and we see the second angel giving us some info, as well as the fourth angel. <coughs> Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. And it says, Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now look at um, Revelation 18. We're going to read a couple extra verses here. Starting in verse 1. In a moment. I think you're still thinking about it. There we go. <clears throat> All right. It says here, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And uh, we know this to be the fourth angel of Revelation, who actually comes before the three angels. Um, believe it or not, it's already happened. But um, it is also known as the loud cry. And it says, Having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Verse 2, And he cried mildly with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Okay? Now we're down to verse 4. Verse 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, 
Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. Okay? So here we see a parallel between Ezra and Nehemiah, who came out of Babylon, and the people of today that are called out of Babylon. Okay? Now, for them, Babylon was literal. For us today, not as literal, but the meaning is still the same. Okay? Well, I think today it's spiritual Babylon, is it not? It is. Very much spiritual. <clears throat> so, we see a parallel here. Where else do we see parallels? How about... Uh, Rebuilding the temple, restoring and cleansing the temple, you see a parallel between then and now. Go ahead. I know you did. Well, Reformation, how about the, the reforming that we're process that yes. we are and will be going through? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The soul temple, the heart temple, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Cleaning that out, absolutely. But also a reference to 1844, the cleansing of the uh, of the temple. Okay, when Christ did what? He entered the most holy. That's right. Now you see, this is where the world got left behind. Uh, many many good Christian churches today are still sitting in the holy place, not in the most holy place. Okay. And, uh, and so that's something that we need to remember as well. You know, a lot of good Christians out there, they just are missing what the Bible is saying about the duties and the job that Jesus is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. And the Bible is very clear on this, okay? But it is a divisive portion of the message even within our church. And... Uh, <clears throat> I got a YouTube video this week from one of our members, and I looked at it. Uh, how many of you know Dennis Preeby? Yes. Anybody know Dennis Preeby? Yes. Nobody knows Dennis Preeby? Yes. We got one, two. <laughs> All right, so Dennis Preeby works for Amazing Facts, or preaches for Amazing Facts, and uh, he's been around for a lot of years. Uh, he has always been very Bible based. I found it uh, very fortunate for me that my freshman year in college, he was my Bible teacher. I know that dates me a lot. <laughs> I thought I'd be saying that. But uh, he was my Bible teacher. And uh, he was my Bible teacher just a year and a half after the removal of Desmond Ford from Pacific Union College. Okay. Now, if you guys don't know that history, um, that's okay. Uh, Desmond Ford had a problem with the sanctuary, okay? Sanctuary message, as well as a lot of other things. And, uh, and he taught it at PUC for a very long time before Dennis Preeby and the other biblical uh, teachers and uh, professors there got together and uh, called him in and showed him, once again, the Adventist message um, and uh, he still refused to, to teach it, and so he was asked to leave. And when he left, there was a huge split in the church. A huge split. Uh, his, his leaving took probably 70% of all the known Adventists that I knew at the time at PC. 70% gone from our churches. And I grew up at PUC, and I grew up in our Adventist schools. I went to every Adventist school in the area, not by choice, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I even went to a public school that was taught by all Adventist teachers, okay? And, uh, and so, yeah, I was very sheltered, but somehow I made it through. And... Uh, this is the thing. I have very, very few of those friends that I grew up with 
that are still in the church. And many of them left at the time of Desmond Porter. Their parents went with him and set up their church and, uh, and, and studied. It was an Adventist church met on Sabbath for about five years. And then it became a Sunday church. Yeah. Imagine that. So you see, um, it's easy down the road to look back and say that was wrong. The message was wrong. We knew that at the time. But this is the progression. Once the devil gets a hold, boom, down the road, he takes you all the way. All right? <clears throat> Ultimately, the call to worship really has meaning only when the one called is to worship is worthy of worship based on who they are in character. And that is why we worship God. <clears throat> now, we've seen the similarities between the first, second, and third angel messages now with Nehemiah and Esther, uh, Ezra. And uh, so now let's move on. What is the everlasting gospel? Anybody know what the everlasting gospel is? Anybody want to shot at what the everlasting gospel is? It is good news. <laughs> That's why it's the everlasting gospel. It is good news. What is the everlasting gospel? Yes. I'll take a shot. You go right ahead. Dear God, we give glory to him for the honor of his judgment has come. All right. Um, that is what Revelation 14 says. That uh, it says we need to get out and preach the everlasting gospel, and then it gives us some uh, direction. Okay? But it's not specifically what the everlasting gospel is. What is the everlasting gospel? It's not really hard. It's not a hard question. I didn't expect it to be a hard question. That God is king of kings and Lord of lords. Mm -hmm. That's the ending of it. <laughs> Les, is it John 3.16? Yeah, oh, who's talking? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, yes. Okay, the everlasting gospel is in John 3.16, yes. Okay, and, and that's the middle section. Okay, go ahead. Well, it's, it's that he came and died for us and redeemed us yeah. back to him. Yeah. That's the middle part. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. See, the everlasting gospel is a gospel that's going to be everlasting, but it had a beginning. And the beginning was at Adam and Eve. Okay? When Adam and Eve sinned, the everlasting gospel went into effect. Okay? And there was a promise in 315 that a redeemer would come. Okay? And, uh, and that promise went all the way down to the time that Christ was on the cross. And he redeemed us, yes. Okay? And then it even goes further down there because he's going to be redeeming people as he did through the Old Testament all the way through to the second coming when he finally redeems the whole world at the same time. Okay? And it doesn't stop there. That's why it's everlasting. Okay? And so when I ask that question, I, I just like that full answer. Everyone was correct in their portion of it. Okay. So the first part is creation. Creation. Adam. All right. Okay. So, good. All right. Let's move on to purification. This, this was uh, Tuesday's lesson, I believe. Purification. The scriptures talk about the dedication of the wall and then the gathering of the singers. And in Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse 30, it talks about purification. It says, Then the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people, the gates, and the wall. Now, how do you purify? Well, we know how you purify people, but how do you purify gates and a wall? Would it be by dedicating them to God? Yeah. yeah, it is. Dedicating them to God. It's, it's really uh, a formal, I don't know what you call it, procedure, ceremony. ceremony, thank you, 
It's a formal ceremony that uh, represents a dedication of something. Okay? And so that's how they did that. Now, um, the Hebrew word for purify means to be clean. That's simple, very simple. To be clean or to be pure. And it is used in many texts in the Old Testament, including those with the idea of morally pure. Okay? Where, where does that word moral come from? Well, it has to, to do with your character, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. Yeah? Where, where do we hear uh, in the Old Testament the word associated with moral? What about the moral law? You heard about the moral law? What is that? Ten commandments. Ten commandments. Thank you. All right. So when we say morally pure and clean before God, obviously the Ten Commandments are in there somewhere, right? Yeah, somewhere. We'll figure out where it's real long. All right. Turning your Bibles to First John one. First John one. We're going to start in verse 7. I know we should probably start in 6, but we're going to start in 7. Because that's what I'm listening to. So, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. And it says, But if we walk in the light, what's the light? Truth. God's light. Truth. What is truth? <laughs> Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you. Thank you for establishing that for me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if we walk in the light, and he, who is he? Jesus. Jesus. As he is in the light. Okay. Now, is there anybody here who does not know how Jesus is in the light? Okay, so we can explain that really quick. Okay, so it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, what, how is that in common? How is it that we have fellowship with one another if we walk in the light as he walked in the light? How is it that we have fellowship together? What is fellowship? We share the word of God. Okay. God, Jesus is the truth. He is everything. So if we share the word of God, therefore we are in him. Birds of a feather flock together, right? Okay. Anything else? You had your hand up, or you going to say the same thing? Or? Well, I think we have fellowship with each other, but we also have fellowship with those outside, because if we are walking in Christ's light, we will, we will love those other people no matter what. That's right. And we miss that sometimes, don't we? Because uh, from our point of view, we're thinking we need to get it right, and, and we need to be like Christ in, in our lives and stuff, but we miss the point that he came to save the lost, not those that were already saved. Isn't that our testimony? I mean, that is what we share with Christ, is that same testimony, that same relationship with God. Yeah. All right. So, a few Bible verses. You can either jot them down. Don't bother turning to them. We're going to go through them too fast. Psalms 119, 105. I know you all know this one. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light, light unto my path. We're talking about the word of God. So if we have any questions of how we can be in the light as Jesus was in the light, these are the verses we should use. John 8, 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Okay? And what's the light? The truth. The truth? Who's the truth? Jesus. That's right. Okay. Now, 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen generation, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay? So these are just a few texts that help us establish what the walk in the light is, and as he was in it, we also need to. Now looking at the rest of this verse, it says, And the blood of Jesus, his son, who's his? God's father. God the Father, purifies us from all sin. Interesting. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. <clears throat> I want to say some things on this, and I'm probably going to get in trouble. Good. <laughs> We're ready for <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> let's read the next part first, and then we'll come back to this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful yes. and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, a few weeks ago when I taught the lesson, I brought this out. Let's see how well you remember and listen. Um, does asking forgiveness for our sins save us? Yeah. Good, you remember because remember the last time there was a few yeses. And so um, when we read it here, it says, when we confess our sins and he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness, does this save us? Yes. Yes. <laughs> if he forgives us and, and purges our sins, we're forgiven. Yeah. All right. So then why is it that confession of sin does not save us? You have to be truly repentant and turn from that sin. Hmm. All right. So, um, now I'm not being argumentative at all, and I, I don't want to make fun of anybody, but if we turn from our sin, does that mean that we are no longer <laughs> sinning that sin? Well, well, I was going to say, we can turn from our sin, but like many things in our lives, we can turn from something for a short period of time and go back to it, and so we can go back and forth. Now, our characters have to be changed to become like Christ, and they call that sanctification, and that can take a lifetime. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's not... Forgiveness of sins, I kind of thought that as a little kid. Okay, I did something bad, okay, uh, you know, pray and ask for forgiveness. Okay, I'm clean now, I'm good to go. And then down the road, more sin, more asking for forgiveness and so forth. And it becomes a kind of a game. It's uh, really, we have to come to the point where we no longer want to sin or do those things that we know to be wrong. But it's not, um, it's not our uh, efforts we choose, and the Holy Spirit provides the power for us to overcome sins. Thank you for that. Amen. Um, <clears throat> let's read a couple of Bible verses, and then we'll get back to this as well. This is my stuff come back. We don't have enough time here. Um, Romans chapter 5. You know, I love Romans. Um, Romans chapter 5, verses 19 to 21 says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Now, I want to talk about this for just a moment. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. What is that talking about? That you become aware of the offense. That's right. That's the whole purpose of the law, right? Yeah. The whole purpose of the law is to point out transgression. Okay? That means you're transgressing the law. And so it's saying, well, over the law entered that the offense might abound. There would have been no offense without the law. Correct. 
Okay? All right. Makes you wonder what happened before Sinai, huh? All right. So, moving on. Um, and then it says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. What is grace? I know. All those in my, my Bible study class know this answer. I wanted to go back to what you said about what did they do before Sinai. Uh, <laughs> well, if we think about it, the whole universe runs on the law of love. And, and Lucifer broke that law. You know, it was all about him, me, me, me. Uh, why is Christ uh, being favored over me and so forth? And so, you know, that was kind of the root of his, his fall. But uh, so, really, there has been a law in effect sure. way before Sinai. Sure. Yes. Anybody who studies the scriptures knows this. And, uh, and but yet, there are those who study the scriptures and will argue the fact that there was no written law before Sinai. And, uh, and maybe it was or wasn't written. It doesn't really matter. It just wasn't written with the finger of God. Okay? Um, so. What does it mean where sin abounded, grace abounded much more? What's grace? Okay, grace is love. What else is grace? Unmerited favor. That's a dictionary term. I don't accept that. <laughs> <laughs> That's biblical. <laughs> it's, uh, I believe it's receiving forgiveness when you don't really deserve it. Yeah. It's given us something we don't deserve. Absolutely. Okay? So, <clears throat> I've done a thorough study on grace, and I don't even begin to tell you that I know much about it. Um, it's, it's one of those things that is, uh, even after you've done the study on grace, it's still very elusive. But basically, grace leads you to Christ. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. It leads you there. So even before you knew Jesus, grace was given to you to lead you to Christ. Okay? Then grace convicted you of whatever's in your life, wrongdoing, if you will, um, and brought you to Christ, recognizing your need of a Savior. Okay? Then grace uh, brought you to a decision to accept Christ as your Savior, and grace then was given to you to overcome your past. And more grace was given to you to continue in your lifestyle that you have chosen to serve God. Okay? Grace just keeps growing and growing. And it gives you power to overcome sin in your life. It gives you power to overcome habitual sins in your life. And it continues to grow with you as you grow with Christ. Okay? So that is grace in a nutshell, if you will, from beginning and no end. Okay? So when it says where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Why did grace abound more where sin abounded? Because it was necessary. Because it was, you didn't know about it until you needed it. I mean, that's kind of what it works. But you had it yes. when you didn't know about it. Yes. Yes. It's recognized. Mm -hmm. It's recognized. That's and where cool. sin abounds, grace abounds much more because it gives you power to sense. recognize and overcome. Okay? <laughs> so, so now we know, just from this one verse, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigneth in death, now, you and I both know that in death, um, nobody knows anything. So what's it talking about here? As sin reigneth in death. Sin causes death. Sin Ultimately it does, but this is talking about currently. <coughs> it's, death is a representation of living in sin. It's a spiritual death. Okay? And that's what it's talking about here. So that as sin reigneth in death, that was before you met Christ, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? Can't do it without it. But it comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, 
that we know that. Let's look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 through 3. And it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? <laughs> Everybody knows what follows that, but we're still on that first question. You know? Does that mean that we can continue in sin? Because we had talked earlier yeah, this, that, that turning away from sin is what we need to do. Okay? And if we turn away from sin, that means we should not come back to it, right? So we've turned away from it. And so Paul's trying to be contemporary here. And he's saying, hey, what do you say then? Shall we continue in sin because uh, in sin, grace may abound? Because where sin is, grace abounds more. And he starts verse 2 there. Certainly not. Absolutely not. Okay? He's making it very plain that when you make a decision, you need to stick to it. Okay? And it says, how shall we who died, remember the death thing? That's what it, Who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death? Now, this is important for us to know. Because all these verses come together so we can see the bigger picture. We're talking about purification. At the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they were purifying the Levites, they were purifying the priests, purifying the walls, the gates, and these sort of things. There's a reason for us to need to understand this, because when it comes to purifying our lives, we cannot do it without Jesus Christ, Okay? And why is that? Romans 5.10, what does that say? It's the number one verse in the Bible. While we were yet enemies, God reconciled us through the death of his son. You see... What does that word reconcile mean? Made right. Made right. Made mm -hmm. level back to zero. It actually is the opposite of um, separation, if you will. Uh, enemy. Um, so reconciliation is going to be friends. You're friends again. Okay? Um, you're friends again. There you go. Uh, back to, I guess they, the Bible uses, well, the one we read, talk about purification of so many things, including the wall. And really, can you purify something like that? Or is perhaps dedication a better word on yeah. something like the wall? We, we talk about it as a ceremonial thing. Yeah, because we, we dedicate many things to God, and I think that's great. But um, so sometimes the wording can confuse us, like, Wall. What would be the purpose of dedication of something like a building or? Um, well, you dedicate it to God's cause. Why do we do that? Because He is everything. Well, dedicating it to God's cause is because we believe in God and we, you know, we want to have a relationship with Him. And so, God, you've given us this. We now dedicate it back to you for Your glory. Would that be like? Sanctification. Would that be like sanctification? Yeah, what is sanctification? Purifying our lives. <clears throat> sanctification is setting aside something for a holy purpose, right? Okay. That's a dictionary version. <laughs> so, yeah, if we took the long version, we'd be here all day. Um, so, basically, it's a ceremonial thing, okay? But coming back to 1 John 1 9. 
It says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What, what does purify us from all unrighteousness? What is that? How do you see that? And really, this may be your opinion, or it may be substantiated by a Bible verse. That's fine. But what does it mean to be purified from all unrighteousness? I got him. Take away our our will to sin. Take away um, the the evil propensities in our lives. Our purify our characters. All right. So this verse is not just a promise of the forgiveness of sin, but it's a promise of something else, isn't it? It's a promise of hey. You have been forgiven, and you now have power to not sin again. Okay? Now, this is at odds with some of our leading leaders in the church today. Okay? I know. Don't give me that high eye right there. Okay? But th this is a divisive thing. If there's anything that I learned this week, I learned that we cannot be ignorant of our beliefs. Okay, we cannot be ignorant in our beliefs. We must be able to understand them and be able to explain them. And that is not going to happen by just listening to someone preaching. Okay? It takes study. And it takes an understanding of what you're studying so that you can then replace it. I got five minutes, right? Is that a five minute bell? <laughs> Is that a 10 minute bell? 15? <laughs> All right. Let's, let's talk a little bit about sacrifices as part of worship. Um, I wanted to get more into uh, this purification thing, but um, I wanted to bring out um, some, some other things here. Let me see if I can find them. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's, let's go to priest and Levites. It's the last part of our lesson this week. Priest and Levites as part of worship. Remember, before they had their celebration march around the walls of Jerusalem, they went out and they got all of the Levites and all of the priests that were involved. You know, usually they just had a, a portion of time that they served, and then they, the rest of the year they were at home, and then they came back the next year for a portion of time. That way it was all shared, and nobody uh, lost time in doing the uh, chores at home. But um, they went out and gathered all of them at once and brought them all in. And, uh, you know, such things as you study in your lesson uh, that uh, David set up the choir that was uh, uh, a part of the Levites as well as part of uh, the descendants of Asaph. You remember Asaph, he wrote a lot of songs and psalms uh, and things like that. These were descendants of them. They were still choir leaders. They were still music the musicians. And so uh, they had quite the noise going on in Jerusalem. In fact, it was heard throughout the countryside because, you know, Jerusalem sits up on a hill. So the sounds went out and could be heard across the countryside. When it comes to priests and Levites, and I have only three minutes here, so I have to skip a lot, so just pretend I said all the things I wanted to until I got to this point. Okay? Exodus 19.6. When was the law given at Sinai? What, what chapter of Exodus? 20. 20. All right, so I'm reading from Exodus 19. So this is before the law was given at Sinai, right? Exodus 19, verse 6, it says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but this should sober you up just a little bit, because this is a New Testament teaching. And yet, it was written before God wrote the law with his finger. Alright? Think about that for a moment. Alright? Then we see it again down in 1 Peter 2.9 where it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light. 
and then Revelation 1.6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory, dominion, forever and ever. Amen. And Revelation 5.10, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Talking about the new earth. Revelation 26, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, everybody should want that one, over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. This is where I'm going to leave you with the lesson today, because the similarities between Ezra and Nehemiah come right down to this day, the similarities of the things that we are going to. The same thing that God wanted for them, he wants for us. Yeah, the cross was in the middle, so we have something to look back on and be thankful for, where they had something to look forward to. They sacrificed animals for them to recognize what would happen, and they become complacent. And here we are today looking back and saying, well, you know, it happened like 2,000 years ago. Maybe it wasn't as important. All right. That's all I have today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you have done for us in sending your Son to die on Calvary and to resurrect him for our salvation. We thank you for that. We thank you for what you have done for us. As we go into the next service, we ask that you will bless us and let us remember the things that you have done for us so that we may be thankful through even this special holiday. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.